No, stop it. Kramer, stop it. <laughs> The body reacts to anything foreign. First of all, it wouldn't be sterile, so you would probably develop a massive infection related to that junior mint. Outside of that, the body does react to it and would form scar around it and probably an abscess around it. Hey GQ, this is Dr. Leonard Lee, and this is The Breakdown. First up, Dr. Strange. The reality is, is that we never wash our hands without a mask on. The point of washing our hands is to clean our hands, and obviously the mouth has a lot of bacterial flora and bacteria that can get on our hands. So we would never wash our hands, go into the operating room, gown, put on sterile gloves, and then touch our mask. That just wouldn't happen. Why do you store all this useless information? Useless? I'm not sure a top 10 hit with a fool horn. Status, Billy? 1977. Oh, please. I hate you. There's a lot of casual banter in the operating room, and this actually does happen. It's not always so intense that we're continuously focused for the entire duration of the operation, but we are able to have some casual conversation in the operating room, and this helps to keep people relaxed, so that if stressful circumstances were to arise, that they would then be ready to act. Dr. West, cover your watch. Some surgeons are very sensitive to noise in the operating room. Some surgeons demand absolute silence in the operating room while they're doing their procedures. Other surgeons listen to music and have a little bit more of a casual environment. Not that the operation is any less serious, but it's a little bit of a lighter atmosphere that other people may feel more comfortable working in. You can't do it freehand. So she's actually at the operating room table without a mask on. And although it's nice to be able to see her face, that would never happen in the operating room. What is it? GSW. Amazing, kept him alive. Left a bullet in his head. Thanks. We never say GSW. It's a gunshot wound. <laughs> Neurosurgeons, heart surgeons, vascular surgeons, a lot of surgeons do utilize the magnification with the glasses. They're not as dramatic looking as his are or as stylish as his are, but we do routinely use them in the operating room. That's called a rangeur, and that's actually an instrument that neurosurgeons do use. Orthopedists use it also. Heart surgeons use it for certain valve procedures. The instrumentation is actually pretty correct. There are computer screens in the operating room that allow us to view images, but less so real time, the way they showed it here, where his forceps are actually going into the brain and you see it on the monitor going into the brain to grab the bullet. We don't have that type of sophisticated monitoring, but the rest of it is actually not bad. I did not agree to that. I don't need you to, we've already called brain death prematurely we need to get a prep for suboccipital craniotomy not gonna let you operate on a dead man so brain death criteria is a very very complicated thing it requires six to twelve hours of examinations three or four different physicians coming in and evaluating the patient it requires a time to lapse between evaluations, and that's why it takes that six to 12 hours. We want to make sure that the patient is truly brain dead so that circumstances like this would never happen. Next up, train wreck. We're gonna get this going. Okay, okay. perfect. Um, I'm gonna mark the knee that uh, we're gonna do the surgery on, All right? Marking actually is something that takes place preoperatively. So this is actually fairly accurate. We do confirm with the patient that we're operating on the right side of the body, on the right part of the body, so that we don't make mistakes. And that's why there are so many safety checks. Once we get into the operating room, there's a procedure called timeout. And the timeout, once again, confirms we have the right patient for the right operation. We have all the instruments and all the equipment that we need for the operation and that everybody's on the same page. All these safety checks have been implemented by the World Health Organization and these are worldwide safety measures that we now all implement and practice so that we want to minimize the things like wrong site surgery. Doc, this is the wrong knee. I'm marking this is not the knee to do. This is not this knee. This is gonna go great. This is the bad boy we're gonna split open. There are always news stories about operating on the wrong side of the patient, removing the wrong organ. These are obviously absolutely disastrous complications. 
something that no surgeon would ever want to be involved in. I'm here for you, okay? You're nervous, I'm nervous. Surgeons never tell a patient that they're nervous, even if it's true. We want to reassure the patients, comfort the patients. Telling a patient that you're nervous is probably the last thing you would want to do. I said, you gotta let me go to sleep. I have a surgery, and you know what she said? She said, no. Hey, I'm taking a rain check. We never want to be in a situation where we're fatigued going into the operating room. Unfortunately, uh, there are always circumstances where that can happen. If you've had an emergency the night before, and then you have early morning surgery the day after, it can happen. Hopefully, however, your judgment would tell you that if you are too fatigued, that you either postpone the operation or have one of your colleagues perform the operation the next morning. It's not unusual for a surgeon to work 60, 70 hours a week, which means nighttime getting called in for emergencies or weekends getting called in for emergencies when it's your turn to take call. Next up is Seinfeld. Good. 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 So this is probably one of the most famous medical surgical scenes that has ever been played on TV. There would never be a reason for a gallery to be in the operating room sharing the space. And if they were in the operating room, they would all be masked and out of the field of view. Where'd you get those? The machine, you want one? No. Yeah. There would also never be food in the operating room. These are all no-nos, and that can all lead to breaks of sterile environment. No, Snoop Kramer, stop it! <laughs> the body reacts to anything foreign. First of all, it wouldn't be sterile, so you would probably develop a massive infection related to that junior mint. Outside of that, the body does react to it and would form scar around it and probably an abscess around it. We're very cautious not to leave instruments or sponges or anything like that in the body. The body will always react to these things. So there are counts at the beginning of surgery, the numbers of needles on the field, the number of instruments on the field, the number of sponges on the field, everything that we would use in the operating room for the purposes of performing the operation is counted. At the end of the operation, prior to closing the patient, all of these things are counted Again. We'll open the peritoneal cavity, exposing the body's internal organs. Nurse retractor. The operating room environment is primarily the surgeon's responsibility. So anything that happens as a consequence of the operation is gonna fall on the shoulders of the surgeon. He's in charge of everybody in the operating room. He's like the captain of the ship or the conductor of an orchestra. Everyone is taking the orders from the primary surgeon. Next up, the good doctor. She is a, a surgical resident, and this is obviously one of her first more major operations. A first big operation would perhaps be a memorable event. It's probably more memorable, however, for your first operation as an attending surgeon, which means after you're done with all your surgical training, you are now an official surgeon on your own, and that first operation is the most memorable. Is everybody ready for a timeout? Dr. Claire Brown, lead surgeon. Dr. Neil Melendez, attending surgeon. Dr. Sean Murphy, assisting. So I wish every time I walked into the operating room it was quite a processional like that with people waiting on you hand and foot, but it's never quite that dramatic. The timeout process is something that happens every day. However, we don't introduce ourselves. It's all known who we are. The other thing is that the timeout would be done prior to the patient going to sleep being anesthetized. So this patient is already under general anesthesia. We have the patients participate in their timeout process so that they hear it and they know that we know what we're doing. Dr. Jan Lancaster, anesthesia. Donna Petringa, scrub nurse. Shani Walden, circulating nurse. The number of people in the operating room is dependent upon the operation. It would be very rare to have that many people in the operating room scrubbed at the table. The most common circumstance is a primary surgeon, perhaps a resident and maybe one other resident or an assistant of some sort. And then one scrub nurse, and those would be the only people who would be sterile at the operating room table. The other people would be an anesthesiologist and then what's called a circulating nurse. That nurse is responsible for being 
in the operating room but not sterile at the operating room table. His or her responsibility is to get equipment and supplies for the people at the operating room table should they need anything. Next up, spies like us. The first step in an operation of this particular type is to shave the patient. Nah, forget it, forget it, get on with it. It may be obvious to some, but not obvious to others that when we talk about shaving the patient, we're talking about shaving the surgical area. So his abdomen would have been shaved so that there's no particulate matter, there's no hair in the way, because the hair and the hair roots can be quite dirty, so we want to make sure that that area is shaved clean. And now the first incision. So even in, under battlefield conditions, the same tenets of sterile technique would hold true. The patients would be prepped, meaning they would be shaved, they would be cleaned, antiseptic would be applied to the wound, masks would already be on, the gown and the gloves would all be sterile, so they wouldn't be touching all sorts of other things like books and manuals. They would only touch things within the sterile surgical field, and they would certainly not be putting their masks on after they're gowned and gloved. So the masks that everyone is wearing for COVID are general use masks, the masks that loop around the ears. They're a little bit uh, less tightly woven than the masks that we use in the operating room. The masks that we use in the operating room tend to be specifically designed for the operative environment to minimize the likelihood that bacteria or or bugs from your mouth get into the surgical field because that's the primary purpose of it is to keep the surgical field as clean as possible. So they are a little different, but in principle, it's the same thing. This man is dead. So if there were ever a situation where the patient died in the operating room, we would all jump on that patient, start CPR immediately. We wouldn't just say, oh, well, they died. Let's move on. So CPR is uh, short for cardiopulmonary resuscitation, and that's a way of getting the heart going in a situation where the heart has stopped. Most patients are candidates for CPR. It's a very, very rare circumstance where we would not do CPR. And those are primarily patients who have what's called an advanced directive, which means that they have decided beforehand that if their heart should stop at any time, that they do not want any invasive procedures, they don't want anything done extraordinary uh, to save their life. A lot of that decision making depends upon the disease state the patient has, the age of the patient, other medical issues they may have, the patient's wishes beforehand, how long we've been trying to get them back, we've been doing the CPR and trying to get them back. Uh, all of these uh, impact our decision-making as to when to give up. Often involves multiple people being involved in that decision-making, and uh, it's, it's not something we take very lightly at all. The second step in an operation of this type is anesthetic. We would never be in a situation where we are referring to a manual during the course of an operation. There are operations that we don't necessarily perform very often. And when we prepare for surgery, we do review some things about the operation, and that's not unusual. That's all done in preoperative preparation. We might be able to get that source by Googling. The problems with things that are posted online that is that none of it is vetted. But for those of us in the industry, just like all of you in your industry, you know what's real, what's not real out there. So we can look things up online. It can be also be text, it can be journals, it can be whatever, uh, as long as it's a credible source. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for part two where I'll be breaking down more surgery scenes.